attention. So uh, people have, have developed, and particularly Ian Robertson and, and colleagues have developed the SART where you're responding regularly, responding to every digit except the number three. And this gives you a rich reaction time time course. So you, you higher um, reaction time variability predicts lapses of attention on this task. A problem with it in terms of trying to look at neural signatures of sustained attention over time is that these stimuli uh, produce uh, stimuli which flash up with abrupt onsets and offsets. And this actually, to an extent, captures exogenous attention, which uh, is problematic when you want to get at the kind of more sustained endogenous changes that, when, uh, that you're uh, particularly interested in with sustained attention. So um, myself and colleagues have developed uh, really a, a set of paradigms uh, which um, give more direct experimental access to fluctuations uh, of sustained ascension. And a key element to these, these measures is really their simplicity. So this task on the left here was developed by myself, Reverend O'Connell, and Simon Kelly here, here in UCD. And uh, this task, you have to monitor these simple patterns. They're on screen for 800 milliseconds. And you have to respond to a longer duration pattern, which is on for 1120 milliseconds. So the only the only difference here is that so the, these these stimuli differ only by the duration of the stimulus, uh, and, and otherwise, perceptually speaking, they're identical. So this minimizes that exogenous pop out, if you like, of the, the target stimulus, and means that you're more subjected to the endogenous control of focusing continuously over time. So we can have a, a look at this. If this works. So you're looking at these changes. There's kind of a rhythm to the task. There's no ISI, there's no in-stimulus interval. It's continuous. You're watching for the longer duration. And notice also that it's flickering. So it's flickering at a rate of 25 Hertz and this drives a steady state response. So you have a continuous steady, steady state response throughout the task. Okay. And the other task we've developed again with Redmond and Simon, but also more recently, uh, Dave McGovern, who's developed this in, in uh, DCU. So here is a similar kind of principle, but you're looking at um, uh, the contrast change. So you're monitoring these uh, pattern stimuli and the contrast dips and then resumes back to normal. And here we've included mind wandering probes during the task. So asking people whether they were focused or whether they were mind wandering uh, intermittently throughout the task. So we can have a look at this one. So there you go. The projector is making it flicker somewhat, but you get the idea. Gradual change in contrast, and it resumes back to normal. So all the, and they have the 25 hertz flicker there to drive the steady state response as well. So, so there's all of these tasks require your continuous engagement over time and uh, optimal for, for looking at different uh, neural, signature, neural signatures of attention. So we can um, turn to that next. So first then the CTAP, CTET, the continuous temporal expectancy task here on the left. So we, we looked at neural signatures predicting performance on this task. And here you can see uh, a period of up to, if I can get the mouse to work, which I can't, oh, there we go. Uh, a period of up to 30 seconds prior to a target. So we're looking at in red here prior to a lapse of attention or a miss, and in blue uh, prior to a hit. And these shaded areas are, are periods of statistical divergence between the pre-hit and the pre-miss period. And what we're seeing is a sort of slow maladaptive increase uh, in the alpha, uh, alpha uh, rhythm at this point, up to the point of elapse. And by comparison, prior to a hit, you have more desynchronized and stable activity within the alpha range. If we look at the SSVP signal uh, during the same period, we, there's very little difference pre-hit and pre-miss in terms of uh, visual excitability. So this suggests what's happening in the alpha um, range is something upstream from basic visual processing. It's consistent with the alpha inhibition hypothesis that we, we are uh, slowly disengaging from externally monitoring similarly on the screen and, engage, and, and turning inward towards mind wandering. And as we showed here, we could predict errors up to 20 seconds before they occurred. Also, you can see here, 
There's a signal uh, which is a P3 signal coming from frontal uh, regions. And this signal was involved in really tracking the, the temporal duration of the pattern stimuli. And as you can see, this signal drops away in amplitude prior to a miss. So you can see that as the mind starts to wander, as alpha begins to synchronize, eventually this impacts the basic mechanisms of the task as people are engaged with it. And finally, we come to the longer duration uh, target trial itself. And you can see that there's a, a classic marker of visual ascension, the parietal P3. This amplitude is larger for a hit and reduced in amplitude uh, for a miss. So we've got a number of markers going on here, these longer term drifts in alpha, which are occurring up to about 20 seconds. Uh, when Once these hit um, a particular threshold, we begin to see the breakdown of performance monitoring uh, during the task. And finally, the breakdown of uh, processes underlying target detection itself. So we were interested in methylphenidate, which is also, of course, known as Ritalin, and how this would affect uh, lapses of tension on the task. Uh, so there's been some work with, uh, largely work done with uh, Ritalin methylphenidate has focused on behavioral improvements in ADHD, but also in uh, resting states, often with EG resting or fMRI resting states. So we were interested here in how it would affect these, these uh, EG sensitive markers. Uh, so the, again, we use the CTET and we use 40 neurologically healthy adults. And as you can see here, this is the alpha signal. Um, MPH is in red, placebo in blue. So you can see there's a selective suppression of the alpha signal. Uh, and we also showed that the variability, the fluctuations in the alpha uh, signal were rendered less variable across the majority of participants, vast majority of participants in this trial, as shown in this inset image here. We also showed that in this pre-target period, then the four seconds prior to the target, we had the MPH increase the amplitude of the P3, tracking the temporal uh, structure of the task. And finally, the classic measure of uh, visual attention, the parietal P3, you can see here was boosted uh, by uh, methylphenidate as well. What's kind of interesting here is that um, uh, the MP MPH also, because of perhaps its role uh, in neuroadrenaline, and increasing neural gain. Uh, we see that there's an increase also on the rare lapse trial when someone's under the drug condition. So this suggests that the drug is pushing uh, performance nearer the threshold to detection, uh, even on rare misses in, in, the, um, in the task. I should mention that I haven't met uh, that methylphenidate's got an indirect agonist. It's affecting neuroadrenaline quite broadly in terms of its cortical effects. It's also affecting dopamine in terms of prefrontal and striatal systems. It's having quite a broad effect. So this initial study then kind of demonstrated that uh, methylphenidate can affect these attention relevant signals during a, a sensitive task. And it gives us some indication of, of different markers, if you like, which are relevant to um, people who respond and don't respond to, to Ritalin. So it's useful in that regard. However, one, I suppose, limitation here is that um, uh, specifically with respect to alpha as being a marker for lapsing attention, is that, um, yes, we see desynchronization of alpha, but also in a different context, as we approach sleep, when we get very drowsy, alpha also reduces. Um, so yes, we see synchronization of alpha when we're tired, when we're mentally relaxed, but alpha gives way to theta during stage one or just at the onset of, of sleep. So this creates a bit of an ambiguous uh, index of vigilance. So in one sense, alpha is suppressed when we're engaged visually. Uh, it's, it's a marker for methylphenidate, it's suppressed, but it also suppresses just as we're at the, at the other end of the arousal spectrum when we're getting very, very drows drowsy. So my uh, colleague, uh, Thomas Adrelon, uh, wanted to sort of, because of this ambiguity, wanted to explore a different marker of attentional lapses. Uh, and that is uh, at the other end of the arousal spectrum, and that is sleep-like slow waves. So just a little background on this. So um, traditionally, EG activity when we're asleep and we're, we're awake, we're considered to be quite dissociable. Um, so when we're asleep, we, we tend to show uh, these trains of delta waves um, across the scalp. Uh, so these high amp amplitude, uh, delta waves. And at the neuronal level, this seems to correspond to synchrony of, of act, uh, activation and deactivation at, at the neuronal level. So you get this kind of pattern uh, based from experimental work with animals, you see uh, this kind of activity. And this is 
considered traditionally quite distinct from waking states when EG is more desynchronized, um, uh, we have more high, uh, high frequency activity recorded at the scalp level, and at the neuronal level, this corresponds to more sustained firing patterns within the brain. However, when we are awake, we sometimes see these sleep-like slow waves. Now, they're quite transient, they're local in time, you see here. They're also relatively local in space, so they're a bit more isolated wow. uh, topographically on the scalp. Uh, and they're certainly not generalized across the entire scalp, as you would see in with delta trains when you're sleeping. Uh, and it seems that work suggests from Thomas and others that these local uh, sleep or these sleep intrusions, if you like, correspond to a kind of period of quiescence or, or a neural silencing. So you're in the last week of term, you're in a, a school committee meeting, so it's not your fault. These sleep intrusions sometimes uh, come on board. So this is sort of what they look like. Um, during waking states, you can compare here, uh, waking slow wave, a, a sleep-like slow wave to an to a actual um, slow wave during sleep. And you can see that they are sort of a bit more constrained topographically uh, in sleep. They tend to be, the density of slow waves tends to be more generalized. Uh, also, they correlate with both objective and uh, subjective markers of arousal. So when your pupil size is small, when you're, um, which is a marker of low arousal, you can see a greater density of these slow waves uh, on the scalp. And also when you're producing low vigilance ratings, you're subject subjectively um, um, less vigilant. Again, you're seeing a greater density of these uh, slow wave rhythms. So myself um, and Thomas uh, Agilon, who's now he was at Australia at the time, but he's in the Paris uh, Brain Institute now, uh, so we collaborated along with Elaine Pingle and Mark Belgrove in Monash University, and we wanted to this time look at the pharmacological manipulation of these sleep-like uh, slow waves, as well as some of the other markers I've discussed. So we looked here at the more, more kind of um, extensive drug study, we looked at methylphenidate again, which, as I've said, increases adrenaline and dopamine. Uh, atomoxetine, which um, also is a stimulant which increases uh, neuroadrenaline and dopamine, it's believed to have a, a bit more of a selective effect within prefrontal cortex than, than uh, methylphenidate. And lastly, we looked at citalopram, which is uh, an SSRI, which has more arousal reducing properties. So it's more sleep promoting, it increases uh, serotonin in the brain. So again, these were healthy controls. They all um, took the, the drug uh, 90 minutes before the CTET, again, the same task. Uh, and there was a one week washout period uh, between uh, each condition. So let's look at the uh, behavioral effects then, first of all. Well, as we anticipated, uh, methylphenidate improved performance across the board. So it, it reduced false alarms, you can see here. Uh, it uh, also reduced lapses of attention or misses, as you can see here, and it sped up reaction times, as you would expect. Um, Adamoxetine had a stimulant effect, but not one that, not a particularly helpful one. So not one we anticipated, uh, anticipated. So it actually increased false alarms relative to the placebo here. So it made participants a little bit more impulsive, if you like. And finally, um, citalopram, which increases serotonin, has this more arousal reducing effect, had the effect we predicted, which it would, recruit, it would increase lapses of attention on the task. So it increases uh, misses relative to placebo here. So first of all, we, we replicated these kind of methylphenidate effects on the classic markers of attention. So again, methylphenidate decreased the alpha rhythm, suppressed alpha, and you can see here relative to uh, placebo, you can see suppression of the posterior alpha rhythm uh, and the classic marker of uh, attention, the parietal P3, again, methylphenidate in red versus placebo, it increased the amplitude uh, of, of that signal as well. Um, but there was no difference in either of these signals, in alpha or the, the P3, uh, for the amoxetine or the citalopram uh, at conditions. So neither of these signals could explain the drop in performance uh, in these two drug conditions. So that brings me on to the uh, sleep-like slow waves. So here you can see that citalopram does have a, a selective effect on increasing uh, these sleep-like slow waves. And you can see here we're looking, this is overall relative to placebo. Uh, this, we had 10 blocks of the CTET, and you can see very clearly in green here, uh, these uh, sleep-like slow, slow waves increased across the entire task. And here uh, we're looking at um, 
And the difference between citalopram and placebo, and little clusters, as the black dots here are uh, significant clusters which discriminate placebo from citalopram. So you can see there's a general fairly broad spread in terms of the density of these slow waves uh, in the citalop citalopram condition. By, con by contrast, if we look at clusters of electrodes, uh, adamoxetine and methylphenidate, you can see if anything, there's a reverse effect. So there's a suppression of these slow waves under those drug conditions. Now, one sort of interesting aspect um, of these slow waves is that you can look at um, their spatial location uh, and look at how they spatially predict different kinds of different classes of behavioral errors. So in this case, misses, false alarms, and uh, reaction times. And um, what you see is you see different associations depending on their spatial location. So for misses, for example, where you have slow wave distributed over central regions towards the more posterior parts of the scalp, this um, predicts more unresponsiveness um, and sluggishness, if you like. Whereas by comparison, if you uh, have slow waves at the front of the scalp here, uh, this actually produces the reverse behavioral effect. It makes people more impulsive. Um, so it produces a different type of behavior. So the implication here might be that when slow waves are occurring frontally, they're, they're disengaging networks involved in frontal executive processes, making people more impulsive. Uh, if they're occurring more posteriorly or centrally, they're disrupting sensory motor processes, giving rise to more sluggish or unresponsive behaviors. So it's quite interesting there are these contrasting regional effects of slow waves. And if we think about that in comparison to say alpha activity, e.g. alpha, it tends to have a more homogenous uh, effect. So alpha is, uh, as I've said, is positively correlated with misses and reaction times is negatively correlated with false alarms. So more alpha, more misses, more slower response times, as we suppress alpha most of the time in, in tasks like these, we see better performance, but occasionally we get trigger happy responding. So alpha is more about the engagement of visual attention and the withdrawal of visual attention. It's more of a, a sort of general arousal uh, affecting the visual system. Whereas I think there's something intriguing about slow waves because it offers a bit more in, ter in terms of um, these regional specific effects. It seems to be knocking out specific networks depending on what um, processes are engaged or what networks are engaged. Okay, so a little interim summary there. Um, so sustained tension is fine-tuned by a combination of neuromodulators, adrenaline, dopamine, uh, serotonin, to sort of optimize arousal levels. And we've shown that we can, uh, I suppose, uh, pharmacologically emphasize these different uh, neural signals and that may have implications for uh, a better understanding uh, these uh, different disorders of attention in particular. So we've shown that methylphenidate seems to selectively modulate these classic markers of visual attention, e.g. alpha and P3, uh, and improves performance. It doesn't change, uh, or it slightly suppresses slow wave expression, uh, sleep like slow waves. Uh, AT, uh, adamoxetine, ATM, um, it's a little bit more uh, confusing in, in the sense that it induced impulsiveness without any of the improvements that you see with methylphenidate. Um, we could speculate that might be because it's having this more localized effect within prefrontal uh, cortex, but uh, it's, um, we can talk about that a little bit later if you're, if you're interested. Uh, and citalopram uh, has this, uh, by reducing arousal, this sleep-like slow wave effects, increasing local sleep and intrusions. So I guess, I suppose one thing to add here is that all of these markers can be seen in normal healthy individuals who are well rested and who are unmedicated. But we've sort of demonstrated here that you can pharmacologically emphasize uh, or um, uh, expose different underlying uh, relationships between the neuromoduli neuromodulatory effects and the expression of these uh, EG signals. Okay, so I want to move on to something else now, which is uh, another modulator of sustained attention, but one which is non-pharmacological, and we're talking this time about uh, the breath. So yogis have known for sort of thousands of years that, uh, that there's a relationship between mind and breath, and this quotation, I think, quite nicely captures it. Respiration being disturbed, the mind becomes disturbed. By restraining respiration, the yogi gets steadiness of mind. So I suspect any of you that spent a bit of time meditating or engaged in yoga will 
well, this will chime true to you. There's a sense to this when breath is more stable, there's a stability. So our particular take uh, on um, the relationship between breath and attention uh, is related to the role of a, a nuclei deep within the brainstem and then the pons, and that's the locus ceruleus. And the locus ceruleus, as you know, releases neuroadrenaline. And uh, neuro neurotinergic activity has a sort of relationship with attentional performance, which is characterized by this inverted U. So it, it captures a full range of behavioral states from inattentive and non-alert uh, at the left side of the curve to being task engaged or focus at the apex of the inverted U and being distractible and disengaged on the right, right side of the curve. Um, so th there's this relationship, which is really stems from the seminal work of Aston Jones and Cohen showing that um, locus ceruleus certainly has a key role in attention and, and arousal. But also we know that um, the respiratory rhythm influences brain activity uh, through changes to neuroadrenaline. So we know, for example, that deep in the brainstem, the, the pre-Botzinger complex, which is the uh, part of the brainstem, which is our primary respiratory generator, has pathways uh, to the locus ceruleus. And in experimental animals, if these pathways are ablated, this, um, this abolishes the breath by breath regulation and, ex and expression of neuroadrenaline. And it also affects the arousal patterns within mice presented with visual stimuli. So there's a, a relationship here. We also know that in the locus ceruleus, there are chemosensitive or CO2 sensitive neurons. And these neurons fire, um, when, they, when these neurons fire, that this increases the drive for breath. So there's a dual function here where the locus ceruleus is involved in the respiratory system, also involved in the attention system. So we, we wondered whether the locus ceruleus um, would be a sort of key nexus which bridges respiration and attention in a kind of bi-directional way. So fluctuations in breath affect attention and top-down control of attention can regulate the breath as well. So this work, um, as a postdoc is working with me, Mike Melnichuk is really the driver, both theoretically and experimentally behind uh, this work that I'm uh, about to describe. So Mike then looked at the relationship between respiration and uh, pupil diameter. Now pupil diameter is, is a useful kind of proxy measure, if you like, for um, neuroadrenaline, for, um, uh, for locus ceruleus activity. So we know if you look at single unit recordings from the locus ceruleus in, in uh, monkeys, we, that we see a relationship there. Now, we should be cautious here because the, locus, the, the pupil diameter doesn't just correlate with neuroadrenaline. Uh, it's correlated with a range of regions within the reticular, act reticular activating system, so the broader uh, subcortical arousal system more broadly. But nevertheless, um, so Mike looked at uh, pupil diameter as a marker, and as you can see here, so we have pupil diameter in black and respiration in gray. You can see that they rise and fall in phase with each other. Uh, they're slightly offset in time with pupil diameter occurring slightly before the respiratory changes. And we found that there's phase coherence both at rest and when somebody's engaged in attention over time, in, in, um, uh, in this case, an auditory oddball task uh, where the phase coherence is actually higher when we're engaged um, in a task over time. And Mike also, um, to, to find uh, another indirect sort of marker of, of locus ceruleus, he looked at uh, changes in the fMRI bold signal coming from the locus ceruleus. This also showed a phase locking uh, relationship with respiration as well. So if you're unhappy with pupil diameter, of course, fMRI is also indirect, but we have two measures which, which correlate with respiration. Now, um, we're also interested in the role of respiratory entrainment um, during the task, during this oddball task. And we found that the respiratory entrainment seems to be related to more consistent uh, attention performance on the task. So these uh, lighter circles here are participants who show uh, reduced reaction time variability, so more stable reaction time variability. The darker circles are those with higher reaction time variability. And what this circular plot here that you're looking at, um, what this represents is a full breath cycle. So we begin here at zero, the beginning of the exhale, and we go all the way around to 180 degrees, which is the beginning of the inhale, and a full breath cycle comes around again here. So what we um, discovered in this was that those 
participants with lower reaction time variability with better attention performance were seemed to be aligning uh, the beginning of their inhalation to the onset of the task stimuli. Uh, so in other words, the, the task stimulus was, as it was occurring, participants were inhaling. So there was this entrainment of the breath. When we looked at those participants with higher reaction time variability and poorer attention, you can see that their, their task performance doesn't seem to align to any particular point of the breath cycle. They're more distributed across. Um, by the way, as we move out from the center, we have higher reaction time variability. That's what that scale is there. So what Mike was sort of showing here is that there's some degree of evidence that the respiratory entrainment relates to this um, more consistent, more stable attention performance. And there's some evidence from the previous slide that um, the locus ceruleus here may, may be a, a key sort of nexus, key nucleus, uh, coupling respiration on the one hand and the broader attention system on the other. Now, another question uh, is, do we see this kind of respiratory entrainment occurring uh, as an age-related effect, something we were interested in? So why would we think this? Well, we know age is one of the few areas where there's some preservation of sustained attention as an executive function. Of course, many executive functions decline with age, but actually we see preservation. So there's a well-replicated finding in that older adults tend to report uh, that they're more focused, that they report less mind wandering uh, generally during sustained attention tasks. So this is the, the second task that I showed you earlier where we're seeing this contrast fade and we're, in, it, we're putting in thought probes to capture people's subjective states uh, over time. So this work was led with, uh, by Katie Moran, who's a PhD with me at the time. And she replicated the pattern if you compare old to young, old in red, uh, young in blue, uh, higher focused reports and lower mind wandering reports. Uh, and young on this task were much more restless. Okay, so they were they were restless, but more cognitive, cognitively flexible, if you like. They were they were going back and forth between periods of mind wandering uh, and task focus uh, without cost to their performance. So if you look at the, the behavioral results here, you can see uh, the reaction times to, to detect this contrast fade, pretty much the same for young and old. Their hits rates are the same, you can see here, and their false alarms are also uh, uh, pretty much identical. Uh, the, the only difference here is that the young tend to be more variable in their reaction times, which may be indicative of their restlessness, they're going back and forth between mind wandering and task focus, whereas the older maintaining a more stable reaction time pattern consistent with more focused engagement and steady engagement throughout the task. And this work was um, again led by, by, by Katie and also Dave McGovern, who was involved in some of the physiological analysis as well as Mike. Uh, and what we're looking at here is getting more evidence, physiological evidence of this focus strategy that we see in older adults. So you can see here, this is pre-target, uh, pre um, this contrast, uh, alpha is rendered more stable in older adults, much more variable pre-target in younger participants, as you can see here. If we look at the pupil signal, we can see in the old, we pre-target, we see a gradual rise in, in the pupil diameter. Post-target, target, we see a much more timely, robust neurogenergic increase in, in pupil active, um, uh, diameter at this point, post-target. And we also looked at various measures of decision formation in the old and the young here as well. And what you can see here is that the old are much more efficient in uptaking the uh, information concerning, concerning the, the contrast fade. So they're earlier to the game in accumulating information of that contrast change compared to young who are slower to do so. And if you also look at the steady state response, we can see that the old much more faithfully track the contrast change as it occurs Whereas again, the young are less faithful, if you like, in tracking that uh, sensory evidence. So there's a number of indi indicators here that the older suspending mind wandering uh, and, and maintaining more focused strategy, whereas the young far more restless in their approach to the task, switching back and forth between focused and mind wandering. Check the time. So, um, Ralph, this is some new researchers and publishers. I just want to share this would be to finish with. Uh, my, um, Ralph Andrews is a PhD, PhD student with me 
uh, replicated this, this basic finding with old and young differences, but also include, included a respiratory measure. So a respiratory belt looking at respiration during the task. And what you're looking at here is a single participant. And um, again, we have another kind of circular plot. Exhale begins here. We go around for a full breath cycle uh, all the way through. So inhale uh, starts over here. And each of these different points here at the, at the place where a single, the single trials of an individual responding across the course of the task. Uh, and what this is here is called a vector length. And this is pointing to the fact that there's a, a clustering occurring in this area where attrainment seems to be occurring just after the beginning of the exhale period. So if this um, vector line here extended all the way to the edge of the circle, all the points would be in one spot and that would be perfect entrainment. But of course, this is real data, so you don't have perfect entrainment. But there's nevertheless an indication of entrainment occurring uh, in this individual. So what, I've, what we've got here is the, the different vector lengths of all the, the, the uh, participants in this study, which n equals 48. And you can see across um, all individuals, there's variation in this, in this vector length. So the vector length, just to go back one, is just the length of this uh, line here, indicating the clustering. So you can see some people in this study are entraining their breath to the task quite strongly. Other people are showing weak entrainment. And this is actually quite remarkable because the, the targets are actually occurring pseudorandomly at three, five, and seven seconds. So people are altering their breath patterns to engage with uh, the, the different targets here. So on the left here, we have target entrainment. Uh, on the right, we have the response entrainment, so the response after the target. With respect to the age-related effects, I've brought in the older and younger participants. So the older uh, are in the darker colors, so the dark red and uh, the dark blue and the younger and the lighter colors. And what you can see is that by and large, the older people are in training, uh, 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 by and large, the, the high in trainers at this end, both in terms of training to the target and in training their response. Whereas the younger adults, by and large, tend to be the low in trainers. And so this isn't a, a complete split. You can see actually our highest in trainer happens to be a younger adult and our lowest in trainer happens to be an older adult. So there is some variation, but if we look at this uh, statistically, uh, we can see there is a difference. So older people are more likely to entrain to the target uh, over here with the larger effect size and also entrain to the response here, as you can see. So there's statistical differences here. And we can look at the, again, these circular plots to show differences here between the older and the, the, the younger. And actually they're quite similar in terms of the, the pattern of entrainment. They seem to be entraining to this early stage, uh, just after the beginning of the exhale, that, and training this to the onset of the target in both cases. And so this was just last week uh, um, that Ralph was kind of investigating the relationship between these entrainment patterns and performance on the task. And because the gradual detection task tends to be this gradual onset uh, of, of contrast fade, there's not um, reaction times um, are kind of quite, uh, it's not a pressured task to respond. But what you do see is that there's a stronger um, negative skew in the, in the distribution in high end trainers. So because the stimulus contrast gradually dips and then increases back to normal over a 1.6 second period, you can see the, the length of this negative skew in high end trainers indicating that their, this entrainment is facilitating their early detection of the contrast change over time. So there seems to be a performance benefit, if you like, coming through from this uh, entrainment. Okay, so just to so summarize then, um, take our message here is that locus ceruleus, that release an indirect measure uh, from pupil diameter may be important for synchronizing breath and attention. Uh, there's some evidence that respiration, uh, respiratory entrainment is linked to better attentional performance over time and stability of attentional performance. Um, older adults show this higher focus and higher respiratory entrainment, uh, and this seems to be aligned just at the beginning of exhalation. So this seems to be uh, have some terms, terms of uh, some kind of behavioral benefit in terms of the negative skew of the reaction time distribution. Uh, entrainment is not an exclusive feature of older adults, but it does seem to be a more predominant pattern within the older group. 
Uh, so we're suggesting at this stage that respiration might be another useful uh, interoceptive strategy, perhaps to, to benefit focus, uh, an adaptive strategy that older adults seem to be uh, showing. So to conclude, then, uh, I hope I've convinced you that using these kind of very simple paradigms of gradual, continuous unfolding stimuli are quite useful for exposing different neural signatures of attention. It's also useful for looking at the effects of different pharmacological action on attention and non-pharmacological -pharm changes by looking at these respiratory changes uh, over time. Uh, what comes next? Well, we're, we're interested at the moment in trying to get a more causal role on the uh, contribution of the locus ceruleus. We want to look at, we're currently looking at uh, patients with isolated brainstem uh, lesions. So we're looking at contrasting these patients with patients with lesions to the cortical attention network. And here we're sort of getting a better handle on the role of neuroadrenaline underlying fluctuations and uh, deterioration of sustained attention, but also to get a better sense of this coupling, whether the locus ceruleus provides a coupling between breath and attention. And lastly, we want to look at um, more of a causal role for respiration. So here we, we're interested in actually using this kind of contrast change as a, a pacemaker for breathing. So we're get, getting people to follow these contrast changes to regulate their breath. I think this would be useful for better understanding the, the mechanisms underlying breath-based practices, um, breath-sensitive practices, and um, uh, just getting a better sense of the therapeutic benefit of, of breathing in that sense. Um, and lastly, we want to do this both consciously uh, where we get people to consciously modulate their breath. But given that there's these entrainment effects, we want to use naive participants to see whether we can entrain the breath unconsciously by presenting uh, different paced stimuli over time and change with a hypothesis that slowing down the breath will stabilize the attention system and improve performance. Okay, so that's all I have to say. Those, thank you to my collaborator. Thanks so much, Paul. Very fascinating talk. Thanks. Um, Can't you open up any questions in the audience? Some other hands. Thanks very much. You sort of reading a little bit about intro reception, just in respect to anesthesia and monitoring and monitoring the yeah. autism. A lot of the work, the practical, I suppose, tasks that people use are very focused on heartbeat. Mm. And I was just wondering, is there Presumably, there's a natural relationship there between respiratory and, and heart, or are you suggesting that this is a better measure or a, just a different measure? Yeah, well, I suppose that the, the, the one advantage of respiration is it's one of the few kind of, um, uh, I suppose, bodily signals where we can take control over it as well. We have conscious control of it, we can regulate it in that way. And some of the kind of entrainment effects or the, the changes that you see in relation to. Uh, changing the respiration on cognitive performance. The, the, the performance, the effect sizes can be actually quite large, as large as, for example, TMS studies. Um, so there's substantial changes in that regard. So I think um, respiration has quite a lot of potential in that regard to, to better understand it. Therapeutically, it's used quite extensively, but there's been little sort of basic work, experimental work to really understand what um, patterns of breath centered practice are most effective for maybe improving attention and performance or, or, or the, the more traditional way it's used of course is to improve relaxation and, um, uh, and reduce anxiety for example so I think it has because of that conscious control I think it has a bit more potential. Thanks very much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm well, very intrigued to see this uh, coupling between respiration and uh, uh, attention. And I was wondering, you, you put a question at the, at the end, it was uh, on my mind all the time, so the causality. Yeah. So we, you would have to assume a bi bidirectional relationship that is uh, um, promoted or uh, mediated by the locus yeah. as, a, as an axis. But would you have any uh, idea about the mechanism is one direction stronger than the other? So for instance, in your experiments, did you reduce a jitter? So because you're doing sustained attention, so you have everything very much in phase or yeah so uh, only in the sense in, in, in yeah there's pseudo random uh, presentation so that there is that and, and you see that there's um when you look at the timeline 
the respiratory uh, changes seem to be adapting. But it's, we've looked at sort of time on task effects, and it's it's not very clear that, that there there is it's not easy to find, or at least we're trying to find, but we haven't found yet a pattern of adaption over the course of a task. It seems to be there are either high in trainers, or there's no or people with very strong entrainment patterns, or people who don't have it. So it's almost like a trait thing well, rather than like a bimodal distribution. Yeah, it sounds. Yeah. And the entrainers that basically they follow the non discontinuities. Did you introduce in your yeah um, exactly okay. they, they update that's their so yeah it is I mean that's you no know, that's what we, we were quite excited I mean this is literally from the other week when we were looking at this so we're quite excited by it because you know these aren't very predictable patterns they're they're, they're, they're pseudorandoms so they're, they're somewhat predictable but mm -hmm. people are updating their patterns to the task which I think is intriguing and that's 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 very exciting yeah. that makes thanks Melinda well, that was super interesting and I guess maybe a related question I. I'm wondering, so the timing of your um, pseudorandom target was three, five, and seven. Yeah. Like the day. So I guess that's kind of a regular two second interval of, of a difference. At least, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'm just curious, do you think if you change that interval, whether some people might be more susceptible to entry at a specific mm. frequency? Or right. Or, yeah, yeah. That might be relevant. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, that's so we've just at the moment, you know, most of the, the work so far has just been establishing the entrainment patterns without any sort of manipulation of the, 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 the sequence, just to see whether entrainment exists, first of all. So I think that's an, a, a next stage in the sense that we, we can both um, manipulate the breath, but also manipulate the target distribution across the task and see if we can get effects, whether certain people are, like you say, in train to higher or lower frequencies across time. Don't know, so it's worth looking at. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. Really, really interesting. And um, my question kind of relates actually, sort of relates to this, but also to the earlier work that you presented there about um say the, the kind of the, the pattern tasks where you're looking for new measures of sort of attention. Yeah. Um, and I was just wondering, I suppose it actually kind of relates to the breath thing too, about individual differences there and whether some people would find, for example, that task where they're looking for the, the longer duration. Whether some people would, would kind of find that easier. And I'm wondering if that might correlate with things like musical ability or yeah, experience. Good question. Like right. it's, I was watching it, I thought like it was in four four time, and it was really easy to see when it immediately wasn't out of when it went out of time. It, yeah. It's something we you know, it's a really interesting question. And amongst the people when we were putting this task together a good few years ago now, so there's 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 me, Redmond, and Simon. Both Redmond and Simon are very musically uh, very rhythmic and they're mm -hmm. kind of uh, Analysis of it. It took me long. It took me longer to get the, the hang of the task than they did. They found a rhythm, and that yeah. longer target stimulus breaks. Yeah, yeah. Really and then it fell out of that. Yeah, so you could see it. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So that I think you know we haven't looked at that. Yeah. We were so focused on because we were so obsessed with previous sustained attention tasks grabbing the targets, grabbing your attention in an exogenous way. We wanted to sort of minimize that grabbing, that exogenous yeah. grabbing, to make it like you know. It just you just have to focus and and uh, I wonder whether this would be anything in messing with the rhythm of the flicker to see whether that would change the the kind of the, the automatic synchrony into the, the yeah. timing. Yeah. You know? So the flicker, yeah, the flicker is is twenty five hertz, and yeah. Do you think so, you could add some kind of what do you mean? plasticity into that and have it yeah. randomized? You know? Yeah, yeah, that's not a, that's kind of an interesting idea. Yeah, and then you would have different frequ frequency flickers to measure neurally as well, which. Yeah. Would, you could see whether people are picking up on those different things at the neural level. Yeah, yeah. Do you know, I, it's one of those things I'm embarrassed to say we haven't looked at because <laughs> it's something we should have looked at because it was one of those things where when you're planning the task, it uh, sticks to that. It's something with the breathing one as well. It's kind of again because you, know, you were talking a lot there about people who maybe meditate and so on would, would be maybe have, have a lot more experience with controlling their breathing. Mm. There's probably some interesting differences in there too. And it's just, yeah, yeah. I was thinking about that as well. Like. But, um, you know, when target practice in, in the golf or the archery or whatever, you, you perform your action on the exhale. Yes, that's right. The yeah. Yeah. Now, is the, is the, that in general, that's like exhale for the stimulus. Mm. So I was mm. thinking, as you, this is a great generalization, but as we get older, we're more likely to play things like golf and yeah. target practice. <laughs> 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 but I'm just thinking about the I'm just wondering if that had an effect to their, their own personal sports practice or whatever their practice is. Yeah. Not, not just the, meditation yoga 
What yeah, I think so. I mean, it's true of artery. It's true true of um, uh, martial arts as mm -hmm. well. People mm -hmm. tend to use exhalations to kind yeah. of yeah. uncertain yeah. movements and so on. Not that I do martial arts. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you could tell by that demonstration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I think it does. I mean, it's interesting when you look at the literature on these entrainment effects. We, it, it's it's people adapt to different parts of the of the um, breath cycle so it's, in some cases is exhalation a lot of the work stems from actually shows an inhalation effect so the early part of the inhalation cycle and it seems to be so that the idea here is that if, if we the initial work done in this area is in animals and olfaction and of course breath is a natural delivery system for olfaction so we inhale and we take on board sensory information but there's an argument to suggest that a lot of systems in the brain, even non-olfactory systems, have been laid down phylogenetically because of the olfactory system. Mm -hmm. So there may be a certain bias during inhalation. Oh, okay. Yet that said, we're seeing the effect, which is to the, to the yeah. beginning so of exhalation. You're focusing on the exhale more than the inhale, often because we automatic when someone's back yeah. to yeah. the exhale. I think in this so task, because the contrast is fading there may be something about ex exhaling and then it's fading and you're, you're you're using that as a kind of some kind of uh interceptive marker we don't don't know so you ask people to focus on the breath so i mean obviously then it becomes it's less autonomous you know it's, it's yeah controlled. well that's that's what that's we don't know yet that's exactly what um ralph is doing at the moment so we want to do both conscious and, and you know okay we want you to follow consciously follow the breath and then we're gonna have a naive group that we don't tell them to do anything. Yeah, yeah. And then we just the, the other sort of complication with this is that there's potentially some kind of dual task thing going on as well. So if you're consciously focusing on the breath, then that's going to take the, the attention away from your intentional responses. So there's all kinds of complexities we're going to, have to kind of figure out there. Yeah. An artificial one. Mm -hmm. An artificial one, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Yeah. I have one other question about the pharmacological study. Just kind of the potential, what do you think the potential implications for the SSRI versus the, the metal pendant? Metal pendant. <laughs> um, so in groups where they might have the morbidities that encourage them to take both, like yeah. let's say ADHD, so I think there's high anxiety in ADHD and yeah. morbidity. So they might be on an SSRI and hmm. Ritalin or one of the uh, one of those drugs, yeah, so, and but the, the effects of the slow waves are almost uh, incongruent with the, the yeah. opposite, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I think you no, know, the, the, the point that you know these things occur even without any pharmacology, all these markers are occurring. Um, so we are seeing you know, you, you're even seeing slow waves occurring, um, with methylphenidate, but just less of them. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it's all it's all there that the pharmacology kind of exposes the, the different markers to a certain extent. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's an interesting question. What you would see? I mean, we, we here we're looking at sort of um, the, no clinical diagnosis, just normal healthy controls. So yeah, yeah I'm just thinking a mix that, of a mix. I have an implication for how just long term implication for how yeah. they are prescribed. Yeah, having up to, almost like the cancer to the right of it for a clinical group of both the methadone and the yeah. necessarily. And yeah, I don't know. I'd imagine it potentially could, or that would be sort of tolerance effects and changes yeah. over time but um uh so there's another question for your behavioral <laughs> neuroscience <laughs> projects <laughs> that was a really fascinating talk and um, so i have any more questions or yes <laughs> um just in that study with the different drugs i was wondering if um you look at my wondering with the method candidate during the task no, there were no, there were no probes uh, in that in that task yet. I'm just wondering, you know, with the increase in dopamine, if there could be an argument for increasing the value of the task and mm. the importance of the task for participants. So I know that, and I know it's been it's been contentious, but with the younger and older adults, there is some argument around that being, you know, the task being more important. Yeah. And we see reductions in the mind wandering, reductions in. Uh, well, also with the increase in, I think that I haven't heard of the respiration study before, but that's really interesting that they're um, controlling their breath and, and they're training it to the trials as well on top of that. So I'm just wondering, I think that there seems to be a bit of a link and some, actually, some of the work that I'm doing is trying to bring in, uh, understand, the, I suppose, um, 
how the importance of either or plays a role. Yeah. Um, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if there is actually a lot less intentional mind wandering yeah. or unintentional mind wandering uh, than we than we find, considering yeah. to to the engagement for a while. Um, now, I, I mean, outside distraction is just internal, and maybe with the internal, whatever it is. Yeah. I, um, I, so I'm just wondering, do you think that, that that could be, or is there evidence against it being the importance or increasing the value of the tasks? Or the... Could be. I mean, we've, uh, in terms of manipulation value, we haven't really looked, gone down that route, but it would be, I mean, mainly because there's the mixed effect of dopamine and neurotrogen, so it's a little bit, bit more tricky to, to associate, but. We have, in terms of the mind wandering element, we have talked to Mark Belgrove about this when we were thinking about coming up with a design where we capture different mind wandering states. So you get the kind of un unintentional kind of going AWOL, mind blanking, and disengaging from the task. Actually, so it's more intentional. I'm, that's the one thing I was thinking about in terms of the, the blanking. Uh, when you're looking at the, the, the theta activity, did you find that that was very rare that there was episodes of like the sleep? Like, yeah, yeah, within the task. Is that no, not it's it's relatively frequent, more frequent than you you think. But um, what's interesting with it, there was um Thomas has done another study where he's looked at my mind blanking and mind wandering, and again you get a kind of regional specific effect with the slow waves. So slow waves are more front. It's it's well. What happens is you get because these slow slow waves are kind of traveling waves. They start frontally and they kind mm -hmm. of move backwards. More frontally distributed slow waves are associated with mind wandering. So more active off task thoughts. Whereas when they've when they've traveled further back through the brain, that's linked to more mind blanking. So kind of almost taking out more regions of cortex or, or, or neural silencing occurring more extensively through the cortex. So then you're kind of, you know, you just, it's like that sense of when you're reading and you've completely lost it. And you're... Well, I've looked, I, I looked at that, so I'm very interested in that because I've looked at different states of sort of that gradient between um, being focused on mind wandering simultaneously doing both and that mm. completely doing nothing. Yeah. So I'm really, that's very interesting to know. <laughs> yeah. I think there could, there could be something interesting if you're using a kind of sliding bar because I think yeah. a lot of meditators explain the experience of being in kind of more hybrid states where they're kind of not yeah. they're sort of focused on the breath but they can feel other thoughts emerging and then they may that hybrid state might be transitional between focus and and yeah. full blown mind wandering. I, I find different behavioral effects for different states Have combinations of focus and mind wandering as well. Okay, mm -hmm. interesting to see that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one more. Oh, you yeah. think more questions? Then we have a room for a little bit longer. I think it's really more after that. Just about your stimuli and your really nice thing with the whole little bit of thing. I'm just thinking a lot of the old things we're looking at. Yeah. Especially if I was one thing to look at, you get around by music and then music to the music or well, we, we, we're we sort of switching actually to the auditory version of the task through necessity as well, because um, uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah is, is uh, working with Ralph, and we've been trying to get a version uh, of this degraded visual stimulus, and um, maybe Elaine was sort of know, know a little bit about this as well, but it's um, when, if you've been looking at the, these kind of tasks for for quite a long period, you begin to get kind of strange visual illusions mm -hmm. occurring. Mm -hmm. And it seems that it's fine if the, the contrast stimulus occurs intermittently, but if you're ramping things up and down to create a kind of pacemaker mm -hmm. for the breath, you begin to have all kinds of things Absolutely. occurring. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So we're working on a kind of auditory version, which I think is, is good for two reasons. You, first, you remove all this, these kind of visual problems. Um, secondly, if you want to look at pupil diameter, you have less visual distraction going on. And I think you can get a, a purer measure of arousal that way. So I think um, that will be the way forward for this breath modulation. The, the limitation is that, you know, we need to come up with a stimulus ultimately, which can, can provide us an auditory version of a steady state response, which is a bit more complicated. Um, so yeah, pros and cons, you know. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, thanks everyone and thanks for Paul for a fascinating talk. Thank you. I'm sure the math team particularly enjoyed it. It's their last one of their, their module and they're all here today.